Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Returning guest on the program with us today for our Sprott Palisade Monthly Market Update is Rick Rule. Rick, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Colin. Pleasure to be with you again. I think for most resource investors right now, uh, things are feeling a little bit tough, maybe boring, monotonous. Uh, In terms of a time when all ships were rising, we're talking about almost two years ago now, people are questioning, are we in fact in a bull market? What's your thought on how things are progressing? Uh, For me personally, I think we are in a bull market. You really asked me several questions in that question, and I I, I like to deal with the question in its totality. The first thing is, Colin, (laughs) after 40 years in this market, when somebody describes it as boring, I think that's high praise indeed. Sometimes the antidote to boredom is terror, and I would prefer boredom to terror. But probably more importantly, as a check writer, uh, circumstances where the dumb money isn't competing with me in the market where I have the ability to look at a press release from a company, analyze the press release, and then allocate that allocate capital to the company in the fullness of time without having to compete with uneducated speculators or, frankly, dumb money generalists. To me, this is a really good cer- set of circumstances. When issuers call and tell you that they can't raise money, um, they aren't being honest. Uh, good companies are easily able to raise money in the circumstances. The issuers, of course, preferring dumb money to smart money. But from an investor's point of view, these are very good times. The bull market is intact, and you have been given a buying opportunity. Rick, on the positive side, if we compare now to prior to January 2016, it does seem like companies are able to raise money. Uh, People are not complaining on the phone that this is the worst thing they've ever seen in 50 years. So sentiment is somewhat positive still. Uh, You're currently in Vancouver, which is one of the epicenters of the capital markets for resources. What's the sentiment like right now? Uh, It's pretty funny. It's a good time to be here. The uh, competent, I shouldn't say the competent, That's that's not the right word. The brokers in Vancouver that have traditionally been able to raise money are raising money, but they're raising money for cannabis and blockchain, uh, which means that they're totally absent from markets that I care about. Now, as I say, really, really good deals are getting funded. As an example, Robert Friedland a couple days ago raised $735 million for Ivanhoe in tough countries, uh, South Africa and Congo. So high quality people are raising money. But the truth is that there's room for people even in the highest quality deals. We have been quite active at Sprott in the last six months uh, financing exploration deals, in particular the prospect generators. And it's really refreshing to be able to have a discussion with an issuer that's a sane discussion that recognizes the risks of exploration. It's also nice now to be dealing with clients that have rational expectations understanding that they are funding a risky activity and that they're going to have to wait for 18 to 24 months to see the outcome of the expenditure. Uh, I really like the circumstance that we're in in Vancouver right now. I would describe it in no terms other than rational. Rick, you brought up marijuana, which of course has been a booming market for a couple years now. I've been seeing the numbers in terms of how many capital raises have been coming up and how much the capital raises are being done for constantly increasing and just musing to myself what it would be like if this kind of money poured into resources. Not so much as a question, but have you seen times when this kind of money was pouring into resources? Oh, sure. I mean, every 10 years, we have a rip-roaring, idiotic bubble bull market in resources. Uh, You need to remember, Colin, and I think you'll get it right, uh, but you need to remember when the dumb money comes flooding in and even your mistakes go up in price, sell. Missing the last part of a bull market but missing the subsequent collapse is really, really, really worth doing. Is that your feeling on Canadian cannabis at the moment? Well, I'm not an expert in cannabis. You know, the truth is I haven't done the in-depth due diligence in the cannabis business for probably 40 years. 
Now, <laughs> the truth is, <laughs> it's it, it's amusing that so many uh, Vancouver promoters are interested in cannabis. Uh, it's nice to see them involved in a business that they understand intimately and study nightly on street corners. Uh, Vancouver is very, very well suited to the cannabis industry because of the extraordinary familiarity that people here have, here, here have with cannabis. They're much more familiar with cannabis than mining. <laughs> Interesting. Well, uh, you mentioned prospect generators before. We've spoken about them, uh, but I've been talking about them a bit within my circles, and I've I've been telling people that prospect generators make a lot of sense in the latter part of a bull market uh, because as new companies rush into the space looking for land to run exploration on, the good packages are gone, and they're forced to go do option deals and joint ventures with prospect generators. Um, and so at the latter half of bull market, they really take off. Have you noticed that being the case? That's a good observation, and I, I think it is the case. As you know, I'm much less market-centric personally than I am discovery-centric. So I own the prospect generators as a consequence of the fact that I've enjoyed three standard deviations better performance over 40 years speculating in prospect generators than has been the experience in the broad market. What you say, however, is likely true in the sense that it's easier for prospect generators to turn projects to juniors, to the dumb money, during buoyant markets when they can raise money. As I say, my own approach to prospect generators is very, very different. It is arithmetically the most certain way to participate in discovery which is itself the most certain way to make money in mineral exploration speculation. But I suspect that your observation with regards to market timing and bull markets is accurate. I couldn't confirm it, but it makes intuitive sense. Rick, a theme that we've talked on the last few interviews we've done is the fact that the commodities themselves seem to be either forming bases moving up or some of them making new highs for the year or over three or five years. That has continued. Um, I can't list off the top of my head uh, exact commodities, but vanadium, copper, nickel, uh, cobalt, many of these commodities continue to move up, and now um, oil's sustain, sustained strength. It would seem that it's only a matter of time before people wake up to that and move into the associated equities. Oh, I understand what you're saying, and that's a theme that I've been repeating for a year. The truth is, I'm beginning to get a little nervous. Uh, the move in commodities has been sustained enough. And frankly, the move in the broad market and the economy has been sustained enough that I'm beginning to get a little nervousness about myself, about the fact that we may have a recession in the offing. I'm not an economist, and so people shouldn't read too much into what I have to say. But we've been enjoying a pretty steady economic recovery recovery, albeit a slow economic recovery, on a global basis for about eight years. And one, one wonders how much steam there is left in the global economy, particularly given the deleveraging of central bank balance sheets. So the one thing that scares me is that the, uh, we need to avoid a synchronized global recession for the commodities bull market to continue. If your listeners are relatively sanguine about the outlook for the economy, I think they can be completely sanguine about extractive stocks because, as you say, the delta between the levels which one would expect them to trade at given the strength in commodity markets and the levels that they do trade at are unsustainable if the top line number stays intact. On that point, Adrian Day, who we both know well, Adrian spoke at our conference in Jekyll Island, and he talked about some historical analysis he had ran, whereby when the, market, when the broad market was going up and commodities had been going down and the market crashed, the commodities would typically uh, move up so that negative correlation would hold. But like in 2001 to 2007, when they had both gone up, they both crashed together. And so I guess that brings up the question you just delve into a bit, which is now that commodities are going up at the same time, that security blanket's kind of gone. Colin, I think it, it depends on the nature of the collapse. Uh, if the collapse happens as a consequence of a liquidity squeeze like 2008, commodities get clobbered too. Uh, liquidity squeezes take absolutely no prisoners. 
By contrast, if the consequence of the collapse was uh, overpricing of one particular asset, an example would be, as an example, the collapse that we experienced in the year 2000. Uh, that set off a commodity boom. So I think it's important to differentiate the nature of the market collapse that happens. It is also important, however, to recognize that in the early stages of an equities bear market, an equities crash, that resource equities are equities. And resources crashes in the near term take no prisoners, often because the sell decision is made by a, mar by a margin clerk rather than the investor, him or herself. Absolutely. Uh, Rick, there's been a little bit more discussion about uranium again lately. And when we spoke about this over a year ago, you said that you thought we might have one to two years left for the actual bottom. Uh, what do you feel about the move that's happening? There's been more financing activity and the uranium price is moving up, albeit not that much yet. My suspicion is that the bottom has been put in uh, as a consequence of uh, supply destruction, which you and I have talked about many times in the past. But I see the recovery as being uh, constrained really because of the lack of Japanese restarts. I do believe that the bottom is put in. I think you are going to see a lot more investor interest in the, ne in the next 12 months, not necessarily because of a move in the uranium price, but rather because we expect China General Nuclear to list outside of Hong Kong and we expect Kazataprom to come public. And the fact that the uranium story uh, will be told with some insistence to very large in institutional investors, I think will refresh some interest in the market uh, in the subject, which is right now suffering from complete lack of attention. I also think if you look at perhaps three years, that the supply destruction has ensured that you'll see really dramatic price escalation in the out years as a consequence of new builds and the gap between supply and demand in uranium. I am concerned in the near, ter in the near term about yellow cake prices simply because in the near term, the only way that you can affect demand is by Japanese restarts. That notwithstanding, uh, I, I think we've talked about this before too, Colin, I believe that an increase in the uranium price is a question of when, not if. And if you ask yourself when questions and you have the ability to stay with the trade, uh, the financial resources and the psychological resources, participating in questions where the answer is when rather than where the question is if is confining yourself to very high quality questions. Rick, like I said in the last question, I've noticed uh, several of these uranium companies coming back to market. However, unlike a year or a year and a half ago when they rushed back to market, there aren't very many, if any, five-year warrants associated to these financing. Some of them are even being done with half warrants, which was unheard of a year and a half ago. Um, I, I guess just an observation on the market, is that something you've seen as well? Uh, I hadn't paid attention to it, but... It, it uh, I will rely on your observation, and I will describe that as a function of um, lack of investor discipline. One of the reasons why you participate in a sector that's down and out where the recovery is uncertain is because in those instances, if you have the patience and the courage to allocate capital to out-of-favor sectors, you deserve special consideration and compensation. And investors who are doing transactions in circumstances where the issue will probably have to return to market again before the market turns, those investors who don't insist on sufficient compensation by way of warrant coverage are stupid. Perfect. You're speaking my language there. Rick, on, <laughs> <laughs> on one last note, you do have the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium coming up here shortly in less than a month. July 17th to the 20th, I believe, if I have my dates correct. And that, of course, as I've said before, is my very favorite conference that's put on during the year. I believe we're well past the early bird special pricing. Uh, is there any spots left, and where can people go to find out? Uh, I would be delighted to make some space available for your audience. I believe there's still probably 200 seats left. We're looking to put 1,000 people in place this year. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, have the symposium link. I'm just back off the road. 
but I will uh, have my staff email it to you, which I'm sure you can append to this interview. Uh, I'd be, I'm hoping that I see you at this year's conference. Uh, I think it's going to be the biggest and the best yet. We've, I think, as you know, added Jim Grant to an already sterling uh, speaker lineup. And we will have 80, com- 80 issuer exhibitors there, each of which are owned in Sprott-owned accounts. In other words, we won't admit a company to an exhibitor at this conference if we don't own if we don't know them well enough to own them that's no guarantee that the stock goes up but it's certainly a guarantee that we have vet, vetted each and every exhibitor excellent well i've looked it up it is naturalresourcesymposium.com and there's your picture right at the top so anybody who is interested please visit the site. Rick, thank you so much for coming on. And of course, we will be at the conference on July 17th to meet anybody. Always a pleasure, Colin. Thank you for the kind words. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?